So, uh, welcome to a Law and Sport Insight with me, Sean Cottrell, the founder of Law and Sport. Today, I'm joined by a guest from the US, Scott Bearby, General Counsel of the NCAA. For those of you outside of the US, you may not have heard of the NCAA. Well, to be honest, you should have done, and I think by the end of this um, interview, you'll want to know more about them. So, uh, Scott, uh, could you just, to start off, just to give... Uh, people outside the US and background. Can you tell us a little bit about the NCAA, the work that you undertake, and a bit about your history? Sure. So the National Collegiate Athletic Association began uh, over 100 years ago as uh, a reaction to some health and safety concerns uh, occurring in the sport of American football. Uh, there were a number of, uh, of serious injuries and deaths occurring. So a group of university presidents um, got together at the request of President Teddy Roosevelt um, and formed essentially the, the NCAA. Um, and, and it has, um, it really has three purposes. It, it is uh, continuing to be engaged on the um, sort of student welfare, um, health and safety side. Um, that would include playing rules uh, for the various sports that the NCAA membership uh, um, undertakes. We conduct championships for our member uh, organizations. So we have about 1,200 uh, colleges and universities in the United States and one in Canada um, who um, are members of our organization. And we conduct championships uh, ranging from uh, some smaller uh, events uh, like uh, a cross country competition, running competition, all the way through um, men's basketball and what we call March Madness in the Final Four. Um, and then the third component really is in, in a rules enforcement mechanism. So uh, we have a variety of rules when an institution uh, breaks those rules, then we have a mechanism to enforce and issue penalties. So those would be our primary purposes. And, and to give people some idea, because I think you said that there's what, 1,200 colleges and universities? Roughly, yes. Mm -hmm. um, to give some people an idea, March Magnus is, am I right, is, is the biggest event, that you, yes. the championship that you guys run. And to give some people the idea of the size of, of, the, of this event, it generates somewhere in the region of, am I right, $600 million over that period? Is that right? So roughly speaking, when you add our media contracts uh, and our, our, our television and media rights agreements um, and... Um, and other revenues coming in that that's a, a probably a pretty good estimate and so when when did you uh, become involved with the NCAA and, and how was, how did that journey start sure so I I've been on staff 14 years um, I just recently came into the general counsel title um, I started as the uh, we, we were a one lawyer shop back in 1999 when I started and I made it a two Lawyer shop. Um, we uh, and so I really joined as um, um, with an interest on on joining higher education. Since the NCAA is is comprised of, of colleges and universities, I wanted to be involved in that space. After having been in a private law firm for six years, um, and the NCAA was looking for somebody with this the skill set I had, which happened to be on the business and nonprofit side. Um, the NCAA operates in the U.S. as a, a 501c3 charitable organization. So I had some experience on that side um, as well as um, being an avid sports fan. Uh, so that certainly was, uh, was very appealing when I applied for the position. And so, so you mentioned you've got charitable status is that so? Yes. Um, th that must bring another level of complexity over to a, a traditional sort of general counsel role in, in a in other sporting organisations. Does that what does what does that mean to you on a day to day basis? Um, you know, on a day to day basis, we just need to make make sure that we understand when our organisation is engaged in um, um, a taxable um, activity and and when we can operate. Uh, with the tax exempt status, so um, we we can um, uh, you know we we will pay income tax on things that are unrelated to our mission and enterprise, uh, um, but things like championships are considered uh, integral to our um, to our mission, and so those are activities that that are um, by and large tax exempt for us. The the revenue coming in, okay. 
So it, it, it allows us then, you know, understanding that the money the NCAA takes in then is distributed back out to our member institutions. Um, we keep only what it takes to run our championships and to run some of our programs here um, for students. But, um, but otherwise, the revenue goes back out in, into our institutions, and they can use that money for either athletic purposes or educational purposes. Um, but we really serve as a, a conduit for the championship revenue coming in that we then distribute out. Um, and, and I should say, because it, it may be confusing, um, we do not, con we do not, the NCAA does not control um, the American football um, championship for right. colleges, uh, the BCS, and, and now what will be a playoff. Our member institutions all are part of that enterprise, obviously, um, but that is an activity where they've said, we want football to be handled by um, a, a different administrative body. And so, um, so any revenue coming in from that never goes through the NCAA. It goes directly back to the institutions. Right, okay. And is, is, is that primarily, the, was that the reason for them doing this? Or was, it, um, some, was there any other reason for them separating? Well, I, th I think there are a variety of reasons that, uh, that um, you know, Division I football and, and, the, and those that play in, in our postseason bowl. Um, I'm sorry, can you just say, what, what is Division I? So, so a, sure, so okay, fair, fair question. Right? <laughs> so we have, the NCAA has three divisions of membership. Um, if you think about them, uh, and it's a federated system, so some rules apply only to um, some divisions and other rules. Rules apply to all, but but roughly speaking, um, Division Three would be uh, the typical um, profile would be a smaller liberal arts college uh, that um, um, funds um, um, let's call it a dozen or more sports, um, men's and women's, and um, they their distinctive quality is they've decided not to award athletic scholarships. Right. Um, so. There's no athletic aid um, being awarded uh, to students on those campuses. The Division II profile would be a school that is sponsoring a slightly higher number of, 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 of sports. Um, they do award athletic scholarships, um, but not at the level that some of our larger institutions uh, do in the United States. So Division II would be a, some of them are public institutions, many of them are private, um, but they tend to be um, budget wise smaller institutions. Division one would be those that most folks uh, around the world would recognize um, not only for their sports but but to some extent for their educational programming. Um, and those would would fund the highest number of sports and they would also uh, um, expend the most money toward athletics, um, right. uh, both in terms of competition and, and facilities. So that would be, um, uh, so when, when I speak about Division I, um, Division I football, um, there, there's really actually two, two segments of that, um, because even within our divisions, we have um, small, you know, smaller, not, not unlike, I guess, some of the soccer leagues, levels of, um, um, of quality. Um, and so um, Division I bowl teams are typically at our highest level of bowl football uh, right. competition. Um, and they're just distinguished from everybody else. So I think part of the reason for why, um, going back to your question, and part of the reason for why that championship has been excluded from the NCAA is because it is a fairly small number of institutions that compete, right. unlike March Madness, where we have 300 institutions that at the beginning of the season are eligible to, to be in the tournament. Uh, and then throughout the season, it, it whittles down to the, you know, to the key 68. In, in football, that's really not the case. You're really starting with a much smaller number of right. institutions. And I hope, for at least your sake, that your team has now increased and there's more than two of you there. <laughs> <laughs> there are. We we are now um, essentially a five lawyer shop. Right. Um, 
and um, and that's relatively new. We had um, we had been at a three to four um, head count uh, uh, just recently. Oh, so you must have been very busy. I take it we are. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we're very much generalists. Uh, as a result, we 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 uh, dabble in a lot of things, but um, but. But it, it is difficult to uh, we we know when to get outside help when we need it. So um, can can you explain because I think it's it's a rather unusual structure the actual structure of the NCAA that um, in relation to uh, the body that sets the rules mm -hmm. and then how you police those rules. I think it's slightly, it's slightly different than what we have over here. Yeah, I think one of the things that might be most um, most unique when you think about our member institution. So we're, we're a voluntary membership organization. Schools can come in um, if they meet the qualifications. They can also choose not to be a part of it anymore. And so as a result, um, the NCAA's jurisdiction is, is on the playing fields and on the competition fields in setting playing rules. Um, we are in the championships postseason space. But for instance, we don't control um, personnel decisions that our individual campuses make as coaches. Uh, we don't have say um, for um, um, anything that would happen regular season. So if, if there is a, a, a baseball game occurring, um, the NCAA doesn't get any revenue from that. Those are all institutional, right? Uh, you know, institutional autonomous yeah. kind of decisions whereas you look at many professional leagues um, as an example where they really are um, the the ownership is is fairly tight in and and there really are standardized personnel um, decisions and and um, revenue sharing and those kinds of things that take place which which we don't as an organization and does that make it more difficult for you or easier well what makes it I think most difficult is when we consider passing a rule, and a rule is passed by our members, it's, a, it's either a direct democracy or a representative democracy, depending on what the issue is. But, but ultimately, you have a, a, a wide array of, um, of constituencies. Um, we're run by university presidents, which have a, a very different look at higher ed than many of our coaches do. Yeah. And yet we are passing rules, by and large, that have the biggest impact on coaches. So um, we have presidents passing rules of, for coaches to, uh, to abide by. Th that's challenging. We also have the challenge of uh, very large schools and very small schools all trying to live within the same rule framework. And, uh, and so it, not unlike what you see in passing you know, federal legislation yeah. or... Um, countrywide legislation, we very, very much have that here because there, there's not, there's very rarely one agenda. There's, there's usually many that we then have to try to uh, figure out where, where that coalition is um, that that will pass a rule that people can live with. And so, th th so am I right that you've got presidents who, who are running the schools? Then you've got the athletic directors as another mm -hmm. level, and then you have the coaches. Right. Sure. So, and the athletic directors are. Are an important part of, of our decision making, um, and in between athletic directors and presidents, um, you may hear of conferences. Uh, yeah. So the Big Ten, the Pac-12, the, um, those names have been changing recently, and yeah, the membership has been changing. Um, and those are decisions again that are um, market-based decisions, if you will. The the NCAA doesn't determine which school is in which conference. That's a, a school and conference decision. And so there is, there's the NCAA, there's the athletic conference, and then there's the university. And the leads of all those groups, the presidents, the, the commissioners of the conferences, and the, and the athletic directors, and the coaches. And then we have a student-athlete group that also um, gets to weigh in on legislation as well. So we have, obviously, them. Uh, we, we, you know, we need to keep them um, happy and, and understand what their needs are. Um, and then up the ranks. And so by the time you get back to the end of a legislative process, it may look nothing like <laughs> sort of where it started. Well, that, that's a lot of people to keep happy. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult, I guess it's a difficult line to tread and, and must take some skill in negotiating 
um, all those different interests. So that 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 must have thrown up some very interesting scenarios. What would you say is the most either intellectually stimulating work that you've done, or most interesting from just uh, just the facts of the case that you've worked on? Yeah, you know, every every day really in in my fourteen years has been different, um, and um, and so you know it has been in, incredibly um, rewarding um, professionally to work for instance, on our multimedia agreements for our championships. And, and I've had the, um, the great privilege to work on two sets of those, which have been um, incredibly collaborative and incredibly time-consuming. Um, but to try to fit all those pieces of the puzzle together to, to create a um, you know, multi-championship um, television and digital rights agreement, um, so uh, um, those those have been you know unique opportunities to say that that you've know, been able to work on on those large um, large transactions um, you know but it also I, I probably enjoy most my conversations with our student athlete advisory committee um, because they bring a a, a, a really interesting perspective um, they're they're the ones that are again living through our rules. Um, they're the ones going through college, and um, and they all have just these great questions about well, you know, what about this? And, and particularly as it relates to te technology, because um, not unlike what we're doing here um, with Skype, I mean, they just are so sophisticated in the way they approach technology, uh, and it's so natural to them that um, I, I learn a lot from them about how we should be broadcasting. Yeah. Um, events and and how we should be presenting information to them so that it is being educated, you know, truly being effective uh, in our educational efforts. That's fantastic. Um, and so, can you just again? It, I think it's good just to give someone uh, someone outside the U U.S. some sort of idea to the scale of your broadcasting. I think they've got an idea now that the size of the organization and the and the challenges you're facing. So, your latest broadcasting. Uh, agreement was how much were your rights or valued at in the U.S.? Well, um, so we, when when you look at our total operating, um, we're we're out for another twelve years. So we had a, a long term rights agreement, right. um, uh, and um, without without getting specific, although I, I think it it the num there are numbers out there in the oh, media, okay. <laughs> um, but. But um, but you're you're talking about um, um, you certainly in the in the in the billions uh, over that 14 year period, um, and um, and so you know that's a significant source of revenue, obviously for our member institutions um, to um, you know to have a, a long term security, um, you know, knowing what it is we we have uh, in the bank. Uh, over the next uh, the next thirteen fourteen years. Well, um, thank you uh, for that. I think that's an interesting insight into the into your role um, into the complexities of the NCAA, which I find fascinating. I, I enjoyed, as I said to you uh, when we spoke before, uh, the March Madness. I think it was it was really engaging and great, fantastic. And I think people who who haven't uh, started to watch college sport. In the states should I'll definitely be tuning in next year. Um, well, good. <laughs> and I think, uh, unlike uh, in the states, I may, I may even uh, pick a favorite because <laughs> we can do that. Over here. <laughs> so yeah, so, yeah. Um, put some money down it. Well, thank you very much for your time. <laughs> it was a privilege to speak to you, and I know that you're a very busy guy, and uh, really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to to talk to us. Sure, I enjoyed it as well. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Scott. Okay.